That's quite a long and complicated title, but really what you're going to get from me today is um, something of a story, a whistle-stop tour of the kind of things that we, we do, and I'm going to try and take you through the whole process of everything that we do as a, as a, um, as an organis- a charity in the West Country looking to protect um, natural environments and, and urban environments and, and people uh, from some of the nasty things that can, ac- and can occur out there in, the, in, our, in our environment. Um, just starting with a picture, obviously, that for, for anyone local, that's Topsham, down on the X estuary, um, which is where I live, which is nice. Um, but actually, for the purposes of this story, I'm actually going to be talking about um, a river catchment, because we talk about river catchments as our unit of management um, in, 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 uh, in river, river management and river restoration. Um, we're going to be talking about, I'm going to be talking about the Tamar. Um, and this... Uh, image here that you can see on the left is the, what, what, um, what the Environment Agency refer to as the wider Tamar catchment. Actually, it's, um, the Tamar itself only um, come, reaches its tidal limit at Gunners Lake um, on the Devon and Cornwall border. And, but actually, the wider catchment includes a whole, all the rivers that go into the estuary um, of the Tamar down at the bottom. Um, it's about 1,800 square kilometres of largely rural landscape, um, total population just over 300,000, but as you can see from the other map on the screen, um, by far the majority of those people, around 280,000 people, live in or immediately around Plymouth. So that makes it quite an interesting uh, case study. Actually, the X catchment where we are now is, is almost no different in the sense that a similar sized population with the vast majority living in or around Exeter. So, um, and it's, it's very, very important to think about whole catchments as units because this really represents the ecosystem that we're interested in. And those people in Plymouth, many of them don't realise it, but they depend on that, this, this whole landscape for many things um, that, they, that they use um, and rely on in their lives. So West Country Rivers Trust, we, take a, we, we subscribe fully to the, what's called the ecosystem services approach. Um, and that essentially is built on the fact that these our landscape, our, our eco- natural ecosystems, provide us with a, a wide array of services that we depend on for our well-being, our, our business um, in, income, our, our very survival, our health, our, and many other things. So this landscape of the Tamar catchment provides people living in and around the area with food, uh, energy, uh, fuel, um, most importantly drinking water. All the, all the drinking water consumed in Plymouth comes from, the, from this catchment. Um, but also the landscape regulates greenhouse gases, um, protects us from climate change, or, or it should. Um, it also plays a key role in regulating the movement of water, um, and therefore when we get flooded or not, or there's a drought or there's not, then it's this landscape that's providing us or protect with the service or indeed not protecting us from, the, from those risks. And if that wasn't enough, then we also depend on this landscape for spaces to enjoy culture, um, um, our social time, recreation, and it also provides ecological networks, habitats for all of the species of wildlife that also depend on this landscape for their health and well-being. So, actually, it's not, it's not quite that straightforward because out there in the landscape, in our very intensively used, exploited, managed landscape, there are actually a lot of pressures that, can be, that, that act which can conflict with the provision, the ability of that landscape to provide us with those services that I've just described. So um, these are just some examples of things that we come across in the landscape. When you have pollution, essentially, is what what we're talking about here, um, particularly with respect to water quality as an ecosystem service, um, then there are things that can get in the way of that fresh water making its way to the animals and ourselves when when and where we we need it. So our, our beautiful landscape actually can come under such pressure that it starts to break down, its functions are lost, and so everyone starts to, <coughs> to suffer. We have ecological degradation, we become more vulnerable to environment, extreme environmental conditions like flooding, um, and people who depend on estuaries and rivers and coastal waters for their livelihoods suddenly have, find themselves being confronted with challenges which are a direct threat to their business. This is... Um, uh, people dredging, so removing sediment from it, from chipping lanes. So when we, t- when we talk about um, ecosystem services in a landscape such as the, the Tamar catchment, we have this way we call them our ecosystem service flowers um, to try and bring home this idea that in a natural system, um, the services that our landscape provides tend to be skewed towards 
things like water purification, regulation, pest control, biodiversity, re recreational amenity value, these kind of things. Um, and the provisioning services, the more productive services, like food production, timber production, energy, um, they tend to be a lot uh, quieter in the, in the flower. When we have a heavily exploited ecosystem, which is almost all of our ecosystems in this country are, that balance shifts to the, to the other way. And what happens then is you, get, or you do get lots of these lovely things that we all need, but you start to do it at the expense of the other services which the landscape also provides. So what, what we're basically on a journey here is to try and find a balance between these two situations. So what we do, the, the, our approach is we believe in a participatory, stakeholder-led it's all jargon, really, but it's basically what we're after. We get a whole load of people from the local area, and we get them together, and we start asking them questions. What ecosystem services do you depend on from this catchment? Um, where are they coming from? Which bits of land um, provide you with the services? Uh, uh, where should we be, what should we be doing to try and increase the provision of services? Who's going to pay? What, how, will, what, how will we know what success is going to look like? Um, and then if there's not enough money and we're not doing enough and the services are being damaged, then where are we going to get the more, more money? So back to first principles. This is where we have to, we have to start with the stakeholders. Um, and it's important to think about these things in, from first principles. So we're talking about water, the provision of fresh water in rivers. It rains. Rainwater is, to all intents and purposes, fresh water. And it then moves through, interacts with our landscape, moves across it or through it, um, and makes its way into our rivers and streams where wildlife, the ecolo ecology of the aquatic environment and ourselves then can use that water to our, to our benefit for drinking or whatever. So th this process should work fine. It's worked for millennia. Um, it's, not, it's not usually a problem. But what, when that water inter first interacts with the land, the, dire the direction in which it moves, down into the soil or over the surface of the earth, um, and the speed with which it does that, has an impact on whether or not the service is maintained or whether or not something might go wrong. Um, and obviously as it's moving through this environment, then if it comes into contact with something that perhaps it shouldn't or something that is e easily mobilised, a pollutant perhaps, um, then it can pick up those pollutants and start moving them. And then we get into a situation where um, some of the services start to get um, degraded. So water moving too fast, picking up stuff it shouldn't, and we're getting into problems. And the fact is that some bits of the landscape play more of a role, a more important role, in this process than others because of their in innate characteristics or because of something's gone wrong, someone's done something to them to, to damage the condition of the, of the land. And we have this conceptual idea that pollution is generated through a source, pathway and receptor process. So as the water arrives on the surface of the earth, if there's something there, a pollutant, whether, whatever it, pesticide, nutrient, manure, whatever it is, that becomes a source, and if the pollutant is mobilised uh, um, subsequently by water along a pathway, then that pollution is in progress, and if it makes its way to the receptor, then, then, that's the, then your problem is realised. And uh, as all great uh, Rivers Trust ideas come along, we came up with this very sophisticated conceptual model um, on the train uh, the other a couple of weeks ago, which is that trying to understand that some bits of the landscape are inherently risky and some bits of the landscape aren't, but there are then practices, which things that people do, which superimpose on top. And um, we get this idea that if you do something really, risk, um, something really risky in a, in a really risky area, then you can cause significantly more damage to the environment than if you do the same practice in a less risky area or indeed um, if you do very unrisky things in very risky areas. So what we're really looking for in the landscape is these nines. Where these places, because resources are limited, we can't go everywhere, we can't survey everywhere, we can't deliver measures everywhere. So where should we go first? We should go to the areas where people are doing risky things on, in risky situations, and then we get the most potential benefit to um, enhance ecosystem service provision, protect the environment. So we consider things like soil. The type of soil affects the way that water moves through the landscape. Um, Poorly draining clay soils, clay soils as the soil scientists call them, um, tend to be more likely to generate runoff pollution um, and therefore we, we're interested in them. Always thinking about if you do something risky on a risky soil, you might cause a problem. We think about land use. What are, what are people doing on the land? How is the land being used and how intensively is it being used? Natural habitats are are less vulnerable to causing pr uh, problems for water quality than, say, um, an agricultural landscape, and particularly cultivated land, in general, tends to generate more problems 
uh, than, than, than grassland systems. And then where stuff is matters. I say that well, I, I'm fortunate enough to do GIS training courses, and I constant, my constant mantra is where stuff is matters. And in pollution, in source pathway receptor terms, where stuff is matters more than anywhere else. So direct connection to watercourse, there's no pathway in the source pathway receptor model. You can't, there's no opportunity to disconnect the pollution event as it unfolds. Steeply sloping ground generate, is more likely to generate pollution and runoff um, than other areas. And hydro, we have a hydrological model where we can apply that to the... To the um, terrain data that we have, and we can identify areas where runoff events are most likely to occur, and then we can home in on those and actually um, try and mitigate any problems before they come to pass. So we generate these rules, um, soil, topography, hydrological connectivity, and we can actually combine those things together to try and come up with a strategic uh, plan, if you like, a, strat a prioritisation of bits of land which we think might be delivering water quality as an ecosystem service disproportionately more than other areas. So that's what, that's what that map there shows. It's, it's, is the soil a risk? Yes. Is it close to the river? Yes. Is it hydrologically connected? Yes. And you'll start to see that there are areas which are coming up as being more th ticking more and more boxes. And those are the areas that we need to go and investigate. So, not doing too badly your time. Ho hopefully I won't keep you from your lunch too long. It's only, I've only got another hour or so, so you'll be fine. <laughs> <coughs> I was just saying before, I just slightly scared you, sorry. I gave this a talk, a long version of this talk yesterday, and it took the best part of an hour and 20 minutes, but you just get the short version, I'm afraid. So, focusing on water quality s still, it's time to talk about a specific ecosystem service. And drinking water is the one that we're working w w most closely with Southwest Water on at the moment. Um, this is the Crown Hill Water Treatment Works. If anyone lives in Plymouth, this is where your, dr your drinking water is processed before being supplied to you. Anyone from Plymouth? Brave enough to come to Exeter? As someone from not from the West Country, it's always wonderful to see the rivalry between Exeter and Plymouth. Um, so for South West Water, the bottom line here, and it is at the bottom, is that water is the resource. Water, that's, what the, that's their business at the, treat the Water Treatment Works. If the supply of water goes down or its condition is, de is degraded, then that has com consequences at this infrastructure. And that is that there's an increased risk that some of the problems, the pollution in the water, are passed on to customers, which is an absolute no-no. That's illegal. They're not allowed to do it. But there is increased risk that it might happen. And also, if there's less, less water available, then that's less of their product that they can that they can supply. And obviously, we know the consequences if water supply is reduced to a point where there's not sufficient. The other implication is that it costs more. If the, water, the more the water quality degrades coming into the works, the more money they have to spend making it safe, um, as they're required to do before they supply it. So here's Crown Hill, down in what used to be north of Plymouth, now it's now firmly in Plymouth, and actually um, it supplies about 60 million litres of drinking water a day to around 80,000 households in, in Plymouth and the surrounding area. Um, it basically, this is the catchment where the drinking water, they have three abstractions on the t River Tavy, which is this blob here. They have a reservoir, Burrital Reservoir, which is here um, on Dartmoor. And, and then they have Gunners Lake abstraction, which takes water from the whole Tamar catchment upstream. And that's where they get their water from. So this is uh, just a bit of data from Southwest Water um, showing... Actually, the, uh, it's just um, the contribution to the raw water coming into the treatment work. So raw water is the untreated water coming from their abstraction. Um, and this is just the, the yellow bar and green bars show the water contribution from the river, two river sources. Not, the reservoir is actually in very good condition. Um, but what you can see here is as they, in the summer months, as the reservoir starts to go down, they switch their sources over to um, the river sources because they tend to, as the reservoir goes down, they need to find alternative sources of water. And this red line shows the average cost per megalitre, per million litres, of treating that water. So you can see as they switch their sources, as they're forced to do, the cost of treating that water goes up. In fact, it, on average, it tends to double, which is quite a lot. Obviously, Southwest Water are paying for that, but they're not really. We are. We're paying for it. We pay bills. And if every time they, get a, they switch over to these sources and the cost of treatment goes up, then, in theory, that gets added on in some way to our bills. We pay for them to make the water safe. The other thing is they have to pay increased pumping costs because they pump, it costs a thousand pounds a day to pump water up from Gunners Lake to Crown Hill, um, whereas the reservoir is gravity fed. So there's all sorts of extra stuff in it. So I'm just going to focus in this, as in this continuing case study on one of the pressures that comes to bear in, the, in this situation, and that's suspend, what we call suspended sediment. Southwest water, look at the turbidity of the water. 
um, and they actually dose the treatment process based on the turbidity. And this chart just shows the average, well, just shows the data really for um, the this, this sort of variation in the data um, between the reservoir source and the two river sources. And as you can see on this log scale here, that the, both the rivers have higher, the higher average turbidity and they experience these astonishing, uh, let's say, as we bold and say, shocking spikes in sediment load at certain times. And, as, and again, this just shows as they switch to the river sources, shown in yellow and green here, the turbidity go, goes up in the water. And where is, that, where is that problem felt? Well, it's felt here. This is a sediment press or a sludge press at the treatment works. When they're treating reservoir water, they do one um, eight-ton press of sediment um, every two days. Um, when they're treating river water, they can do up to four eight-ton sediment presses a day. So that can be as much as eight times more sediment, 32 tonnes a day of sediment being removed from the water before they send it over to us. So th that's the problem. The next thing is w we need to go through a process of working out where the problems are coming from. Where, where, is, where are these problems coming from? And South West Water came to us and they said, we've got this problem, increased cost of treatment, because every time we switch to the river sources, they're so polluted that we have to spend many millions of pounds, probably across the southwest, more treating, treating the water, filtering out the, the sediment in this case. And they said, well, where's the problem coming from? We can't fix this problem unless we know where it's coming from. So where does sediment, that sediment pollution come from? It comes from a variety of sources. Um, here are just some examples. We've got bank erosion in, up in the catchment from livestock damaging the banks. Um, the result of um, certain agricultural practices um, res resulting in sediment becoming available as a source. So when it rains very heavily, storm events occur, and suddenly you start to see this sediment being mobilised off the surface of these fields into the water, and then it's off to, off to Crown Hill to the sludge, sludge press. There's an entrance to a quarry with a road. I mean, there's been dozens and dozens of sources, and they're by no means are they all agricultural sources. Um, but in a rural catchment like the Tamar, many of them are agricultural sources. This isn't. This is a road. Every time it rains, all, this, all the filth on this road just runs straight into the stream, which is just to the side. So we know what we're looking for. The question is where? Where, where should we go to look? And um, this is a, just a very quick summary just to show the kind of things we can do. We divide the catchment up into subsections and we can go out and take samples. In fact, we have automatic samplers and we actually have a, what's called a sonde, which is French for probe, which sits in the river at, at the bottom. And uh, that is on a what's called telemetry box. And that mo is a mobile phone in a box, basically. And that is constantly sending data about turbidity, in this case, into, um, and it will even text, send text messages to say, oh, something's going on, get out there, and then we go out with these less sophisticated bits of kit to find out what's going on. So here's an example of a trace from the sonde, the, the probe. And you can see it's got rainfall flow and then turbidity, and you can see that the turbidity spikes are very closely correlated with, with flow. Um, and at these two times, we went out and we took samples up through these different catchments, and you can see that each catchment, each subcatchment, re responds in a different way, and it actually actually respond differently at different times. So after a protracted dry period, actually all of the catch subcatchments responded with the sediment load, bar a couple. But later on, it's almost like these ones are exhausted their supply, whereas the top of the Tamar, this blue bit, is still got plenty of filth available to send off to the treatment works. Other method we can use is um, we can have a sorry. That's just flick, flick that up to show you that we have a a model um, for sediment risk mapping um, takes into account land use and agricultural practices and soil conditions and hydrological connectivity and actually we can start to put these things together there's a map missing there a sediment availability map on the left now invisible a, hydro a map of hydrological connectivity giving us a risk map where we can then focus in and go and have a look and see if we can find some of these problems and if we zoom in really to a fine scale on the risk map you can identify a field, and when you go there, you see that what looks like the beginning of a mobilisation event of water starting to flow through this almost invisible gully across this maze, what looks like maze stubble. And if a real heavy rainfall event occurred, we'd start to see that s surface starting to move into the stream, which is just over here. So the model is putting us into the right place to deliver the interventions that we need to fix the problem. Um, I'm going quite quickly now because I'm aware of the time, and I'm expecting to see a five-minute warning any second now. Um, needless to say, we've done surveys, extensive surveys of whole sections of the catchment, and actually on one particular occasion, 
um, around 653 pollute sediment pollutions were found in, during wet weather up through this section, small section of the catchment. And we, the reason we went here is because the model told us that's where the greatest risk was. And these are the kind of things that we find. All of this soil up here used to be up here on the field, and now it's all either here or in the river, which is there. Um, gateways, other sources. But the key thing here is that the, the, the model, the monitoring, they put us in the right place to find those problems so that we can actually um, deliver our interventions. There's a huge amount of um, interventions. There's what we call our intervention toolbox, catchment management toolbox for fixing problems of the type that we've just seen. Um, and that brings us to this, which is our, what we call good farm, bad farm uh, picture to explain to people what, how two landscapes, both of which produce similar amounts of food, because obviously we still, we're still interested in a balanced landscape, which is a productive landscape. Um, but on this side... Uh, huge amounts of investment and infrastructure and um, interventions have been delivered to, in, to try and protect the, the river. Um, you can see buffer what we call buffer strips and crossing bridges and crossing points and good yard infrastructure. And what does that look like? It, it looks, these, are the kind, these are just some examples of before and afters. So this is a yard that's un, um, uncovered and they've got a problem with their guttering, which means there's a lot of collection of dirty water. And then we can go in with South West Water's money uh, by the way, um, through our upstream thinking project and actually to help this farmer to keep his clean and dirty water separated, uh, manure stores covered, um, tidying things up. Um, a now quite famous picture of cows doing what cows do. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is basically delivering back to faecal coliforms and potentially cryptosporidium directly into the water supply. So if you're sw the next time you're swimming off Plymouth Hoe, um, remember that picture. <laughs> <laughs> which is not always a good idea. So this is just showing you that we, we can invest. So this is an example of payments for ecosystem services projects. So South West Water are investing in, to help farmers farm in a way that is more sympathetic, that protects their, their resource, which is the water. Um, and just to say that we have a, a, a wide array of um, mathematical models that we can use to try and, A, predict what the current state of the problem is. So this is just showing under current scenario in a small subcatchment we have that around three tonnes of phosphorus, which is a, a nutrient that, um, pollutant, um, and around 120 tonnes of nitrogen as nitrate get into the river in that small catchment. And then we can say, if we delivered a good farm scenario, then what would the benefit be? And um, you can see that the charts are shifting uh, towards what we would call good status, good condition. And so this allows us to back up our arguments to South West Water and say that what we think we might actually be achieving. So that's the water quality story. Um, it's not quite as simple as that because actually we're interested in all of the ecosystem services that the catchment provides. Um, and so all of that, which is just a whistle-stop tour of water quality, has been replicated um, th for flood risk mapping and identifying priorities areas for, to try and mitigate flood risk. Um, by keeping water in, up in the catchment for longer. Um, identifying areas of suitability for wetland creation because wetland habitats hold water for longer and, and then release it over a longer time frame, so thus protecting us from drought. We've looked at carbon sequestration. There is now, hopefully, a burgeoning carbon market um, in the southwest where, because at the moment, you're not allowed to sequester your carbon as a UK business in the UK, which is a little odd. Um, but we're hoping that by identifying areas where the opportunity for carbon sequestration is great, that we might be able to leverage something, looking at opportunities for habitat creation and recreational resources. And also, most importantly, still keeping a clear eye on land value, productivity, because none of these things do we do at, to the detriment of the farmer's business. So the farmer, if he's doing something to reduce his productivity, he will need um, some sort of compensation, some sort of help, because farmers don't can't just give this stuff away for free. They've got a, they've got a business to run. Um, so it's, we're, we're going in and saying, we can help you, we can save you money, why don't you try doing that over there and that over there, and then that way you still get the product productivity that you need, but maybe we might get some environmental protection as well. And you can bring it all together to identify what we call our multifunctional areas. And this is sort of our key message. There are some bits of the landscape which are important for all of the services. So actually, in theory, you could go to them and deliver one thing for one reason, and get benefits in the other ecosystem services for, for free, if you like. Buy, yes, buy one, get one free. Um, 
deliver a farm a wetland for water resources management and get biodiversity free. So if you can find those multifunctional areas, and you get, far, in theory, that's where the cost benefit really, um, really sits. So now we have a shared understanding, and that's important with the stakeholders, of what outcomes come from a, will come from a better catchment, who will benefit, where the services are coming from, who's going to pay, why, um, and where can we go to deliver, the, to deliver the, the most benefit for the money that we've got. And uh, my colleague Lawrence came up with this uh, ecosystem sustainability meter. So we need to go from imbalanced to more balanced. <laughs> <laughs> and this was, picture was done for us by a local artist down in, in Cornwall. And it was kind of our ideal, it's not, as one of the stakeholders pointed out, that's not Plymouth. It's like, no, it's, it's not Plymouth. It's just a West Country landscape. But it, in it is all of the ecosystem services being delivered optimally. And that's the idea. That's what we can, that's what we're selling, basically. So, look at that. <laughs> well, 